So a little about me, I've um, been working in uh, power electronics for about 35 years. I'm an engineer. Um, gravity, warp drive have been my hobby. And uh, I've been working on ways to unite gravity and electromagnetism in a way that would allow us to affect gravity. And Hal Putoff and I uh, independently developed uh, similar models of the polarizable vacuum. And um, I've kind of extended his model uh, toward electromagnetism and quantum mechanics, where uh, actually using some of his own quantum mechanical papers. Um, so I'm going to try to present to you today you know, what's new in, in the polarizable back, vacuum. Most of you have probably seen Hal's presentation, so I'm just going to briefly go over that and then show how I have extended it. Um, in the polarizable vacuum model, we treat gravity um, as a refractive index, K. And so um, from your line element, this is just a simple two-dimensional line element, um, you would set ds to zero for light wave and then solve for your coordinate velocity of light, C of K, which is uh, the normal velocity of light in vacuum divided by our refractive index, which is induced by gravitational fields. Pardon me, I'm feeling a little under the weather today. Um, and then K would come out as the, the ratio of the two uh, um, metric um, coefficients. Uh, it's not always particularly these coefficients. It could just be the G11 or it could, just, it could be a different combination. Uh, it can be directional. It doesn't have to be exactly this, um, but this is just a, a simplified version. Um, I think it was like 1957, uh, Dickey wrote this Lagrangian, uh, where f of k was an arbitrary function of the refractive index, and here you've got the square of the gradient. Um, Hal uses, uh, Hal Puthoff uses an f of k of 1 over k squared, and he gets for a solution an exponential, uh, e to the 2gm over rc squared. And that exponential solution doesn't have any event horizons or black holes, but in the first order approximation, it can completely replicate all the classical tests of general relativity, such as you know, the advanced perihelion of Mercury, gravitational redshift, gravitational lensing, all those things, levi civita um, So he's derived all of that. And uh, I had made a conjecture back in 2005 or around that time that we should be able to treat general relativity the same way and, and use the, the Schwarzschild metric potentials as the refractive index instead of the exponential potential and have answers that are closer to general relativity. Um, so Joe Depp uh, took my conjecture and determined that if f of k were 1 over k to the fourth, we get the right answers. That in just simple taking the Laplacian of the speed of light over refractive index and spherical coordinates, and we get Schwarzschild's solution, um, Schwarzschild's potential. And if we put uh, an electromagnetic force on the, um, the right-hand side, we'll get Reisner-Nordstrom Reisner potential. And uh, in my view, uh, this is actually more consistent because the, the leading constant up front had c to the fourth, and if we're going to consistently use c over k, then you would expect c over k to the fourth. So that's where that came from. Um, so now we've put, uh, taken it out of the exponential, and, and we have solutions that agree with general relativity. Um, in the PV model, um, there are different effects, and you've got your refractive index, and the refractive index for a gravitational field, uh, k is always greater than 1. And uh, where there's no gravitational fields, k is equal to 1. Uh, in an inertial reference frame, far from any matter, k is equal to 1. Um, if k is less than 1, you get anti-gravity and faster-than-light effects. Um, so 
So just going down the list quickly, uh, the, the coordinate speed of light, C0 over K, is the speed of light is slowed um, in a gravitational field. Uh, a length scale is contracted, gravitational length contraction. Time is dilated, uh, clocks run slower. Velocity is slow, just like speed of light, velocity scales the same way. Acceleration scales is uh, the refractive index to the three halves and in, in the minus three halves in the, or three halves in the denominator. Forces, um, force is an invariant. So mass uh, changes as k to the three halves. So there's your mass fluctuations that are, you know, we've been referring to. And um, frequency and energy scale as one over the square root of k. Um, in a faster than light uh, space time, and these, these are in the frame of a distant observer, and pardon the expression, but in the, such as in the rubber sheet view, it, think of an observer far away looking at gravitational masses, he would see a dip in the sheet. Well, in a anti-gravitational field, he would see bumps. So essentially, re repulsive gravity. No. <laughs> I wish I did. <laughs> but the, this is what w oh, um, this is what would you would get if we could produce a, a k less than one. Um, I have some thoughts on how on, and what I'm going to get to is the quantum mechanics of what is k, and and maybe some of us can have some ideas on how we can get there. So. One of the things that I realized in looking at this for the past several decades um, is, oops, is that uh, the coordinate speed of light and in the, from the perspective of a distant observer is covariant with the power he sees. And power being um, vacuum fluctuations of power or the power radiated by any source or used by any light bulb he would see power scaled in the same way that he would see the speed of light scaled by the gravitational field. Um, and this uh, tipped me off to some, a clue. And, uh, and in that sense, I determined that you can model gravity as a loss of power in the zero point field. And I'm talking specifically about the electromagnetic zero point field. Um, in particular, uh, Peter Milani, um, in his uh, well-known book of quantum vacuum, um, came up with this equation, uh, which says that the, the power fluctuations, um, the power absorbed by a particle in the ground state is equal to this, where Q is the charge of the particle, and it's not necessarily E, it could be an ion with a higher, but any particle in its ground state is absorbing this energy uh, at its natural frequency, where E naught's permittivity, M naught's its natural mass, and C naught is the, is the normal speed of light. Um, and then it radiates, when it accelerates, um, this quantity. And essentially, if I plug in this fluctuation for acceleration into here, I get this. And the two are equal. In an inertial reference frame, what you think of this is a conservation, is that the power radiated by the particle in the ground state is equal to the particle absorbed. I mean, the, uh, the power absorbed. And this power relationship, according to Milani, is uh, a necessary part of QED, quantum electrodynamics, in that without this balance of power, the electron would spiral into the nucleus and it preserves the uh, quantum mechanical um, commutation relations. So without this, uh, QED is, is not stable, but with it, it becomes stable. So every particle, every atom I talk about in my paper, which is right now available on ResearchGate, uh, about the um, quantum harmonic oscillator, but it applies to any quantum oscillator from the Schrodinger equation or the Dirac equation or however you want to look at it. And this 
uh, can be thought of as the, the jittering, the zitterbildung of, on the electron. So this leads to a fluctuation in the position and a fluctuation in its velocity and a fluctuation in its acceleration and then a fluctuation in the power. And the power is basically combining all these fluctuations together to get this. What I, what I noticed is that if you have a loss of power, and this is like here's your power at the natural frequency, and you lose some power due to a damping factor, zeta is the damping factor, um, you'll get a redshift, a loss of the frequency, a lower frequency. Uh, going back to what I said on the previous slide, um, you'll also get uh, power is reduced from, in the same way. Be and because the speed of light and power are covariant, you can use the same equation on the speed of light. So these two um, set it up so that everything that was done with the polarizable vacuum model can now be modeled as gravity, as radiative damping, as a damping factor. Here you have the, the K the, with the metric coefficients, and here you have the damping factor. Comes out the same thing, and you can go right down the line. All of the, the, the things are the same, but we're modeling gravity now as a damping factor. And this, this frequency and this equation it's very familiar. It comes from the equation of an underdamped harmonic oscillator. So you could think of replacing the zeta squared with 2gm over rc squared, the gravitational potential from Schwarzschild solution. And, and that becomes a damping factor on the harmonic oscillators. So as an oscillator falls into a black hole or falls into a gravitational field, its energy drops because its oscillation is being damped. And one can think of this as when you hit the event horizon of a black hole, you're critically damped. And if you fall inside, you're over damped and the oscillations stop. So there's how you can interpret away a different interpretation of time coming to a stop at the inside of black hole. That's, that's really a very fascinating model. Uh, however, it says also to us that you will never ever go to anti-gravity, right? Because you, you would have a negative damping coefficient and that's... Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Um, okay, so some of the things that happen here um, are when you have... Uh, let me go back a few slides here. We had this relationship between the power absorbed from the zero point field and the power radiated by the particle, by the, by the particle in its ground state. If you, um, Heidi made the point about the, the atom in the, between the two mirrors couldn't emit. So it's in a population inversion. It's in an excited state, but it can't drop to a lower state. So if we had a way to either reduce the damping factor or amplify the energy driving it. Think of it as you have a, uh, the particle in its ground state is driven to that state by the zero point field and damped by the interference of the matter of the earth or the black hole or the, the galaxy or whatever is a, causes damping in gravity, per gravity, you have two ways. If you amplify, amplify the effect um, of the zero point field. Ah, sorry. Yeah, you're right. It should be A squared. Yeah. Um, it, if you could amplify the, the power driving it, you could inflate matter such that, okay, say you're reducing this, but you could also inflate it, inflate it by driving it harder and thereby extend the length, make your clock run faster, all the things you would expect if you had a refractive index less than one. And so you're, a lot of people think of warp drive as you have to extract energy from the vacuum in order to create a negative energy density to go faster than light. But what this says 
is that if I put energy into it, if I put energy into it, I increase my energy. Oops, keep pushing the wrong button. I increase the energy here. I increase the length and I increase the frequency or the, the, time, the rate of a clock running. But volume increases faster than the energy I'm putting into it. So the energy density actually goes down as I put energy in. So, the, so what is the it that you're putting energy into? The, the ground state of matter. You have to amplify the ground state of matter, elevate it to a higher ground state. Think of it this way. I have this thing here at this level in a gravitational field, it's in, and the atoms are in their ground state. If I raise it to a higher altitude, I've increased the energy of the ground state. So replicate that effect. Replicate what we see naturally as you move away from a massive object. And in that sense, you're reducing the amount of damping or increasing the amount of drive power. But maybe isn't that the same as uh, to change Planck's constant? No, Planck's constant can stay the same. Um, I don't have to change Planck's constant. But how do you want to raise the ground state of, of this energy? Well, like I was saying, if, if let's say your Bohr atom is in the ground state 1s, right? And we bombard it with more energy that resonates it to a higher level, and we keep it elevated to that level. Um, Paul and uh, Sonny did a, a study on particle um, dynamics a couple years ago. And in that model, they did just about that. When they excited the atoms, the atoms actually grew in radius and grew in size. They inflated, just like it says here it would. So there, you can essentially think of it that way, that your atoms in an excited state can be elevated there and, I don't know how to do it, but possibly held there so that we can get these effects. You would say that, because Martin's point is that the ground state is always one half inch bar omega. Yeah, and so you agree about an excited state, omega but, but, uh, but omega. Or, I thought you might be saying that the ground state is now 100 h bar omega or something. Well, it's not h bar that changes, it's the frequency. So you're increasing the frequency with which it's exchanging energy with the vacuum. In that power in and power out, you want to increase that power. And then that's a symmetry. And just like all forces, you know, you have to break the symmetry to get a force. So in an inertial frame, the power absorbed and the power radiated are equal. But in a gravitational field or a non-inertial reference frame, that symmetry is broken and the particle falls to its lowest ground state. So if you can break that symmetry in the other direction, you go up. But you need to create this kind of um, field. Now, what is this kind of field? And this is, my, next is my last slide here. Well, next to the last slide. I'm um, trying to make it quick. Um, in a superconductor, we know that flux, magnetic flux, and this is kind of classical, but still, quantum, magnetic flux h bar over 2e, where e is the electron charge, um, is a quantum of magnetic flux. Likewise, damping is caused by resistance. And resistance is h bar over 2e squared. So we can quantize resistance by how much magnetic flux is in the way, in, in the path of the particles, in the path of matter as it moves. So rather than model the vacuum as electron-positron pairs, I model it as random, randomized magnetic flux, randomized photons in the electromagnetic field. So, and, and just as an example, like if you look at the, a gauge transformation of the electromagnetic field, you're adding to it the gradient of a scalar function. Well, the units of the scalar function are magnetic flux. So Maxwell's equations would become you know, unaffected by the gravitational field, which they are. So in this sense, this gauge transformation becomes a real field in space filled with randomized magnetic flux. I kind of think of, and I don't buy into this at all, but the Searle, the Searle effect, where he had a 
bunch of rotating magnets, all different polarities, all creating a field that's randomized magnetic flux. I don't know if that would really work, but that's the kind of thing I'm talking about, is that if you could create a way to mimic this using, gra using electromagnetic fields, you know, it's something to think about, is we may be able to create gravitational fields. You, you, I mean, the other way, even, Martin, if, if we can increase damping, we can create artificial gravity. So it can go both ways, but we need to understand how to do this. I don't have those answers yet. This is where I'd like to get more people thinking about it and thinking about this model of gravity, which is far simpler than general relativity. I don't need to toss around tensors or anything, but it gives you an engineering, intuitive engineering feel for what it is we need to do. Because talking about space-time curvature and even a refractive index, I mean, for the last couple of decades, I don't know how to engineer that. I don't know what to do with space-time curvature aside from moving asteroids around, you know? So what can, what can I do with that? Nothing. But with this, we can model it as something we can actually think about in terms of electromagnetic fields and how it affects the ground state of matter. And in that sense, hopefully devise some ideas that could, you know, replicate gravity or anti-gravity or even warp drive. Um, I think I mentioned it a couple times. The warp drive, I have a paper that was published in JBIS, uh, Journal of uh, British Interplanetary Society. Um, it came out in volume 68 in February, but it's actually a 2015 edition. That's the uh, electromagnetic quantum vacuum warp drive, which was based on this before I came up with the idea about the damping and resistance. Um, but it included the inflated matter and how when matter is inflated, the uh, um, energy density goes down. And so that's just the effects we want. And I got that published, and it, it's a pretty interesting paper. You might want to check it out. But in that, in that paper, what we're showing is length gets longer. So like in Star Trek Voyager, for instance, when the ship goes to warp, it stretches. It's the only Star Trek that got it right. The ship stretches into the distance, and then the back takes off, and it, it disappears into a flash of light. <laughs> okay, that's the right effect. And in the frame of the ship that has just gotten so much longer, the universe just got a whole lot smaller. <laughs> so that in that sense, you could go faster. Okay, so just uh, some quick you know, points, some things I've found. If we want to uh, mimic gravity or create artificial gravity, you know, what electromagnetic spectrum will produce this? Well, what I found, and it's in my paper, is for an electron, the spectrum starts for gravitational field. The spectrum starts in a soft X-ray, and uh, the proton, it starts at the hard X-ray, and then it can move into gamma rays and et cetera. So, um, you know, so we would want to try to, for artificial gravity, we want to minimize absorption and maximize radiative power. And for anti-gravity, we'd want to ma maximize absorption and minimize radiated power. Uh, so that's it. Any, any other questions? Or? Um, I'm doing it, as everybody knows here, I'm doing an EM drive. Um, down through the center of my drive, I have an optical quartz tube. Um, if I would shine a laser down through that tube and a counter laser down it, do an infrared test on that, so I could test for any time effects, changes effect in that, could I provide data for this? It, it's possible. I mean, I I I'm still thinking about that. You told me about it, but I really don't have a definitive answer. Okay. There's one other thing I wanted to mention. Um, on Tuesday, Jose went over. Uh, oil nautical gravity and the uh, Mach effect thruster and said that you can't neglect the damping. It's part of what makes it work. And here is a relationship that links gravity to damping. In the EM drive, I think it's the same thing, is that it's a dissipative system and the dissipative system doesn't have to be 100% conservative because you're losing power. And so you can have damping within the copper and this may be a reason why 
superconducting EM drives may not be working. And that's why we're not hearing about them. Because when you go to a superconductor, you may increase the Q like crazy, but you've lost all the damping and losses that are making it go. Um, whereas the, it may be a balance between finding you know, the right materials and the right losses and the right heat, heating to maximize thrust. 